A few hundred kilometers south of the equator, the dawn comes swiftly. But in the central highlands of Angola, the approach of peace has been grindingly slow. On the outskirts of the government stronghold of Huambo, a battalion of blue helmets from distant Uruguay guards an invisible frontier. Two hours down the road, the inhabitants of the town of Quito still depend for their survival on the convoys of the World Food Programme. But between the two towns is the open bush, controlled by UNITA guerrillas. They're not laying ambushes anymore. The anti-tank mines have been cleared, on this road at least. But in every village along the route, the checkpoints are still there. Nobody, least of all the World Food Programme's veteran convoy leader, David Shard, takes free passage through UNITA territory for granted. Okay. For most of the past 20 years, America armed UNITA, while the Soviet bloc armed the MPLA. Now America with Russia is one of the guarantors of the peace. Yet not even the USA, it seems, can make UNITA move faster than it wants to. A guarantee of free passage for civilians throughout Angola was one of the essential elements of the Lusaka Accord, but it's still far from a reality. There are still lots of uh, distrust uh, between the two sides. People still not trusting each other. And um, in the movement of people from one area to uh, another, uh, many times you may find agents infiltrated in uh, trucks and so on. Uh, then these kind of things may create still some problems to the uh, free movement of persons and goods. Yeah. Mr. Samakuva is UNITA's chief representative at the Joint Commission, which meets week after week in the capital, Luanda, to try to wrangle the peace process forward. But everyone at those meetings, the UN special representative, the Russians and Portuguese and Americans, and especially the MPLA government, knows that Mr. Samakuva is only echoing his master's voice. For 25 years, the party has had one unelected head and one unchallenged voice, that of Dr. Jonas Savimbi. From his headquarters in the tiny town of Bailundo, way out in the bush, Dr. Savimbi issues earnest pleas and reassuring promises. The promises that matter most concern the disbandment of UNITA's army. In a stretch of open bush near Huambo, the UN has set up one of four quartering centers to register and disarm UNITA soldiers. According to the Lusaka agreement, UNITA's entire force of 60,000 should already have come into these camps on their way to join a new national army or to return to civilian life. At the time we filmed, only 700 soldiers had surrendered. A dozen recent arrivals were lackadaisically building shelters for their families. Under fierce international pressure, thousands more have come in in recent days. But the process is still way behind schedule. UNITA's soldiers, it seems, are reluctant to obey orders. So at least Ambassador Samakuva claims. And, uh, being disarmed, uh, you may imagine how difficult it is to a soldier. Mainly uh, when uh, this soldier has some doubts in his mind about 
the guarantee of his own uh, uh, right of living uh, next day. Não, nós não aceitamos isso porque uh, a UNITA, quando rubricou o protocolo de Lusaka, sabia quais eram os seus compromissos. Não, não podemos aceitar que a direção da UNITA, depois de tanto atraso provocado por ela, hoje utilize esse argumento dizendo que foi preciso convencer os militares. Despite the delays and frustrations, the UN's commander in the region is determinedly upbeat about the prospects for peace. As far as the common man in Angola is concerned, he's fed up of war. As far as the common soldiers on both sides are concerned, they also do not want uh, war. Today, the leadership also doesn't want war. The international climate does not suit the war. There is no Cold War at all. I do not find even one single factor which really contributes to the kind of a theory that tomorrow there will be war and this will be beneficial to any. That kind of optimism is rare in Angola. What those UNITA soldiers think about the future we don't know because they're not talking. But ask the UN, the NGOs, and especially ordinary Angolans whether this time there'll really be peace, and all you'll get is a shrug. Because they've seen it all before, just four years ago. The peace talks, the promises, the soldiers straggling in from the bush with old guns and new excuses. President Dos Santos of the MPLA and Dr. Jonas Savimbi of UNITA both agreed to abide by the result of nationwide elections. But Savimbi's elation and his respect for democracy were short-lived. Soundly defeated at the polls, he turned again to the gun. What followed was the most savage and destructive phase of this 20-year-old war. Towns like Quito, government-held islands besieged for months by UNITA forces, took the brunt. When we first uh, arrived here in uh, late 93, these people were skin and bones. Uh, it, was, it was really bad. It, uh, it's, it's unbelievable what these people had to put up with. Through most of 1994, sporadic fighting continued. Quito could only be supplied by air. It wasn't until late last year, months after the Lusaka Accord was signed, that the World Food Programme was able to start supplying the town by road. Most of Quito's citizens still live in dire poverty, scrabbling a living in the ruins of their town. Backyards and empty lots are full of graves. Everyone has someone to mourn. In less than a year, Eduardo Musungo lost his entire family. Foi um projetil, 220, em cima da casa onde vivia minha mãe, onde bateu o 120 projetil. Então acabou por completamente a minha mãe, inclusive a minha avó, que vem à campa dela, que eu meti lá tijolo, mas a seguir vem Da minha avó é que não se vê porque não meti lá tijolo. Lá a última campa é do meu pai. Meu pai apanhou três. Eduardo's father, his three brothers and his sister were all shot or captured by UNITA. Then came the final blow. Foi uma mulher que a UNITA já tinha cessado unilateralmente. Então, de pé para mão, ela vai lá para fazer as trocas da comida para alimentar aqui em casa. Então, posto lá. Houve confusão, então mataram a minha esposa. And people are still dying, not from shell fire and bullets, and not for the most part in the towns. The main victims are children. The main killer, Kwashiokor, a form of malnutrition that turns babies into plump looking bundles of apathy. Actually, they are eating, but it's not a balanced food. 
It means that they're not getting enough proteins. When you look at Belitza, normally her weight will be quite okay. But when you take a, a better look, you will find out that she's having edema. It means that she's having liquid uh, in her body. For example, here, if we check it like this, we will see that it's leaving a, a cavity here. Huh? Normally, if it was only uh, uh, fat, uh, it would disappear quite quickly. Children like Belita are dying because their fathers have no seed to plant and their fields are sown instead with landmines. It's difficult for NGOs like Médecins Sans Frontières, which runs this clinic in Quito, to reach the villages in the bush. Unita is suspicious of outsiders, and many of the roads are still mined. But what's increasingly upsetting the foreign aid agencies is that the MPLA government is doing so little, even in the areas it does control. Well, the welfare of this country is um, probably uh, at its lowest at the moment. The in under five infant mortality rate is uh, 320 per thousand. That's one in three children do not reach the age of five. That's the highest mortality rate in the world. Um, very few people, only those along the coastal strips and the major towns receive any form of health care. 19% um, of the population have any access to, to education on a sustainable way. And yet it's a very, very rich country. It produces 635,000 barrels of oil per day. The um, minerals, diamonds and other such minerals are immense. But that is also part of the problem. The division of the richness of this country, the division of its economic spoils, creates the sort of problem that we're seeing today. In the seafront hotels and hilltop palaces of Luanda, a tiny elite of apparatchiks live high on the hog. Angola's oil brings in hundreds of millions of dollars each year. But the government has mortgaged much of that revenue for years ahead to pay for arms. The rest, it's rumored, ends up in private bank accounts abroad. If the MPLA has grown rich on oil, UNITA has most of the diamonds. Angola has a good proportion of the finest gem diamonds in the world. They're buried in the clay of the river valleys in the remote northeast. Four-fifths of the diamond region is controlled by UNITA. Diamonds have financed its armies and its generals for years. In the whole province of Lunda Norte, only a tiny area around the town of Lucapa is under government control. Just outside the town, the government mining company, Endiama, scoops and washes and filters the precious river gravel. But even here, there's fierce competition for the riches concealed in the mud. It's a remote and lawless corner of the world. Endiama trusts no one but its own black-shirted private army to guard the mine sites. Just downriver, on land the government theoretically controls, swarms of illegal miners burrow into the clay. These are the garimperos, the diggers. They're heavily armed and trigger happy. This was the closest the company would allow us to go. But in the market in the neighboring village, it wasn't hard to track down the illegal diamond dealers. The prices for everyday goods here are astronomical. With inflation running at several thousand percent a year, the Angolan Kwanzaa is used for only the smallest purchases. To buy diamonds, you need US dollars. The majority of the diamonds bought and sold here end up being smuggled across the border to Zaire. And in fact, very few of the smugglers end up in jail because those who are supposed to catch them are busy digging, dealing and smuggling for themselves. 
the government is now bringing in crack troops to clear the Garimperos forcibly from the east bank of the river. The one thing the government army is not going to do is to cross the river over into those hills there, because that's Unita land, and if it did that, it would be back to full-scale war. The fact is that land here in the Lunders is not just a matter of a strategic asset, of a military value. Land here is diamonds and money. And many people believe that whatever Unita says, it's not going to demobilize in this part of the world, because to do so would be to lose its entire wealth. Os militares da UNITA saem um abrigo do que o acordo, o protocolo Lusaka estabelece e as resoluções pertinentes do Conselho de Segurança das Nações Unidas. 14 months down the line, the evidence is very, very weak that this process will be able to succeed to its uh, final conclusion. Um, the fear is that the whole process will collapse in one form or another. Eu gostaria que a guerra acabasse. Porque com a guerra nós não somos nada. Que é a mesma coisa que perdi a minha família completamente por umas brincadeiras que ninguém esperava. É isso que se deu. Guerra entre irmão e perdemos todos. The church bells are cracked. The churches are in ruins. But all over Angola, the faithful gather to pray for peace. For decades, Angola's leaders were deaf to the voices of their own people. They were dancing to the tune of their Cold War paymasters. Now at last, the outside world has joined the chorus that's pleading for an end to the suffering. But oil and diamonds and the lure of absolute power make good earplugs. There's still no certainty that the people will be heard. Thank you.